continuous condition, of course, you need to say in which function spaces this takes place. Of course, if your boundary is smooth, uh, there is no problem. Everything you can do in Sobolev spaces. Uh, and so one type of result you can get quite easily is that if you star, that if you look at u in some uh, k plus one Sobolev space, uh, and then you map it to the Laplacian of U, you lose, of course, two orders of regularity. So you land in K minus one to less space, and then you have the value at the boundary where you lose one half from trace theorem. And this is an isomorphism, which gives you the well, it's just the well post. And of course, this tells you in particular that if F and G was smooth, then your solution U was smooth as well. Yeah. So that's part for smooth boundary. And what do you do if, your uh, boundary now has singularity. Um, so for example, the Pac-Man domain, yes? And there things are a bit different. So even if F and G are already smooth, it's very well known that the solution of the Dirichlet problem is always H1, uh, but not always get H2 if this uh, angle, or if this angle is between zero and pi, you don't get H2 in general. So magic numbers is three over two, two there, but does not matter here now. And if you do not want to look at Dirichlet null, not just Dirichlet condition, but you want to divide your boundary in a Dirichlet and the Neumann boundary condition, then of course, a lot of things are known. So if the blue boundary here is Dirichlet and the uh, yellow one is Neumann, then there are easy methods where you can reduce this to your old problem. For example, here you can just reflect at the Neumann boundary part and have a full Dirichlet. Yeah, so, so a lot of things are done. So there are very well-known results, for example, for polygons. Uh, often weighted spaces now play a role instead of uh, the usual Sobolev spaces. So I, I call them here Kondiatyev spaces. And so this is my definition of a Kondiatyev space. So we have like two weight functions that are continuous outside of your singularities. So for polygons, which are just the, the edge, the vertices here, that are our singularities. Then the L over here is the, the order of differentiability, and then it looks very similar to normal Sobolev spaces, but you have those state functions. For polygons, polygonal domains in R2, there are very well-known results by Kondiatyev or Masya around 67, uh, that if you have such a polygonal domain, like in my picture, um, this V go directly for the mixed problem, so your boundary without the corners, um, you would there are two different components. The blue one should be the Dirichlet boundary part, and the yellow one should be the Neumann boundary part. And then there is this condition in those theorems that you are not allowed to have adjacent edges that have Neumann boundary condition. So my picture is okay because I only have uh, either Dirichlet to Neumann or Dirichlet to Dirichlet adjacent. You have a weight function rho that um, is smooth away from the corners, and near the corners, it behaves like the distance to the corner. And then you get a well postness result that looks very similar to the one on smooth domains, except that now the Sobolev spaces are replaced by conjugate spaces. Um, so if I have U in such a conjugate space where now the weight function comes from this row I had here, which is distance function near the corners. And here I already put the boundary condition to zero, so that was not so long. And then I get um, to two differentiability lower Kondiatyev space and, and the weights are a bit different so from row to row to the minus one, but it's still an isomorphism. So I still have a well postness result. Just one of the very first results in this type of um, the direction. Of course, there are, are more, but Let's start for today with this result because uh, our program uh, goes into the question, how can we understand uh, this type of result systematically using geometry? What are the things we want to understand? We want, we want to understand why this is the right um, weight function and where does this uh, no adjacent edges condition comes from? why those Kondiatyev spaces are the ones that appear here. So, so that we would like to, to understand from a geometric point of view, because then we can also apply this to other domains, other boundary conditions, other operators. So for example, that's where the title comes from, on domains with cusps. Yeah, I will draw, draw a picture soon. Okay, so that's, that's the goal. And the idea 
uh, to actually do this is conformal blow up. So you have your original metric on your domain. So in our case, it was just Euclidean space. Yes, G0 is just Euclidean metric. And now you multiply this point wise by, by a weight function rho to the minus two. And then you get on your um, domain without the singularities, you get another Riemannian metric. And, and I mean, that's not a new idea that's done in, in several contexts. In particular, if you read the original Konyatjev paper and you interpret it in the right way, then more or less this, that's how it's done there. It's implicitly in the choice of coordinates there. So why do you want to do this? For um, corners in a polygon, it's easy to understand why this is a good idea. So if, if you just look near your corner, yes, yeah, so this is my part of a polygon now, and you look at the Euclidean metric in our case, um, written in polar coordinates where the uh, center of your polar coordinates is the corner itself. Yeah, then it looks like the R squared plus R squared d phi squared. Yeah, and phi is goes between zero and alpha if this angle is alpha here. And I just have some radial part where I've cut it here. And now, yeah, you remember in this Kondyatev uh, result, the weight function rho was just the distance to the corner, near the corner, so it's just r here in the small part. And if I now do this conformal blow up, so I multiply g0 by r to the minus two, then the first factor gets r to the minus two dr squared, and the second one has no r anymore. Um, so if I do a coordinate change now, s equals minus ln r, and this is more or less what what Kondiatev does implicitly in his papers, um, I now have just a normal product metric. And um, my, my corner without polygon part, without the corner, um, like a strip, like an honest strip, um, or half strip starting at minus ln r0 to infinity. And the width of the strip is the uh, angle of my left picture. And this is some, somehow nice. It means if we do this for the full polygon, more or less by this conformal change, so near each corner, we go like r distance to the minus two, all corners are pushed to infinity. Um, and this part looks really like an honest half strip. And in the middle, normally you can do this, that nothing happens. And then, of course, what you don't see in the picture, there are like, like some transition regions uh, between the middle and the honest trip, where actually the piece is no longer flat, but a bit curved. But we do not care. Yeah, so what, what we get with this blow up, we come from something which has singularities and was compact to a nice, and I will say later what nice means, a nice non-compact Riemannian manifold with boundary. We got rid of the singularities, but we paid for it because we are now non-compact. Okay, and now the idea is, how does the well posedness result from Kondiatiev behave under this conformal blow up? And if your weight function is nice enough, we call it G admissible, which means that rho to the minus one, the rho, uh, all derivatives of this up to any order is in L infinity, then you can translate the Kondiatiev spaces very easily. That's also in the paper of Herbert Ammann, uh, that you can describe this, the Kondiatiev spaces with respect to the old Euclidean metric or in general, some metric G0, um, with the help of normal Sobolev spaces on the blown up metric. And moreover, we are interested in the Laplacian and we are now in dimension, dimension two, which is where the Laplacian behaves exceptionally well under conformal changes, the Laplacian with the new metric is rho to the minus two the Laplacian of the old metric. And this just means that if we have now the, this is just the Kondiatrev result on the original polygon. And now we do this blow up and we know how the operator behaves. We know how the Kondiatrev spaces behave. So this means that this Kondiatrev result is equivalent to a uh, well postness result of the Laplacian on this blown up manifold, uh, but now for the normal Sobolev spaces. Yes, and, and this 
that's the idea we are going for. Uh, we are now on non-compact manifolds, but we are on a uniform scale. Yeah, we are on the uniform scale of Sobolev spaces and we got rid of the weight function. So instead of directly prove the Konyatsev result uh, for each domain new, you could go for the well postness result on the blown up manifold. So you could ask on which non-compact manifolds this boundary, we have such well postness of Dirichlet Neumann questions in Sobolev spaces. And of course, this cannot be true for all manifolds uh, because already on the upper half space, this pure Dirichlet boundary condition is simply not true. Yeah, and of course, um, because we know it's not true for any polygonal domain, you, you have to choose it's not unique the weight function, but, but you are not very free. Yeah, so it's more or less the asymptotic near, near the corners that gives you whether it works or not. So it cannot be working for every blown up manifold. In order to get to see what the right choice of a manifold is, maybe let me shortly recall one of the standards way to prove well postness for a Laplacian. Yeah, and so first you normally start with the postness in H1. and for some reason, you get a Poincaré inequality, um, which just means that there's a constant such as all H1 function, the Dirichlet boundary condition zero fulfills that the L2 norm of the function is less or equal to the constant times the L2 norm of the F. And if you have this, then you get for free that already this DF gives you an equivalent norm to the H1 norm, which tells you that the operator is coercive, which by the lux milgren lemma, you get for free world postness on the Dirichlet H1 space. And higher regularity estimates gives you then world postness in HK. So that's normally how, how it goes. And, or one way to, if you want to go for this way, so there are like two ingredients. There's the Poincaré inequality and the higher regularity estimate. Higher regularity estimates are not the issue. Those things you, you normally, you can get if you know it locally on some nice space on RN, you can put them together if your manifold is nice enough and you are happy. Um, where you have to work a bit is the Poincaré inequality. So the question is, what are good classes of manifolds where both Poincaré and so on works? And for this, we use manifolds of bounded geometry with boundary. So I maybe not so interesting to give the actual definition. It means that for example, the curvature and second fundamental form of the boundary and all their derivatives are plus some additional condition like the boundary has a uniform tubular neighborhood and that the inactivity radius is bounded from below. Important to know is not the actual definition, but what's, what's the main feature? Yeah, and one of the main feature is you can work with a countably set of nice coordinates like polar coordinates or geodesic coordinates in, in the interior and something like cylindrical or so-called Fermi coordinates near the boundary that uh, are all in such a way that there you can do whatever you know from Rn and all constants that appear in your estimates are uniformly bounded. Yeah, so that's what this is good for, that's all. And that then gives you that the HS norm on your manifold is equivalent to, to the sum of the localized stuff on Rn. And then you are in, in game that automatically implies regularity estimate trace and extension theorem, everything just from local version. Yeah? So, so, so just glue in, nothing happens. Yeah? So that's you get. But for the Poincare inequality, you need a bit more. So let's come back to the Poincare inequality and let's do um, easy analysis just on, on an interval. I want to prove the Poincaré inequality there just by fundamental theorem of calculus. So I put Dirichlet condition on the zero. And then of course, uh, I can write down F of T in terms of the derivative. And then I can estimate the square of F of, of, F of T just by Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And then since the T is just on a finite interval, I can bound this everything by L. And if I integrate again over T, this gives me that the L2 norm of F is bounded by L squared to so the length of the interval times the L2 norm squared of F prime. And this already tells you, uh, and one can see this, that this is wrong 
if L is infinity. Yeah, so that's why the upper half plan does not work. And, and this already tells you that on the strip, it's easy again, because you just do the 1D case in the direction where the strip is finite, and then integrate over the full strip. And this, of course, something you would like to do now on your Riemannian manifold. So the idea is you start at the point on the boundary and just go along geodesic perpendicular to the boundary such that they finitely cover your manifold. And more or less, you would like then that the integral of your function over M, you can decompose in, in like an integral over this geodesic times an integral over the Dirichlet boundary, which is of course wrong if the manifold is not of product type. So that's why normally here a geometric uh, part goes in, which is just the determinant of the normal exponential map, so some geometric quantity. But if you're on a nice, nice enough manifold, you can control this. Um, but now we already see that from the 1D example, we know that we want that this length of those geodesics, that this should be finite, yeah, because otherwise we will have a problem. And this means we want to have that every point of our manifold should have finite distance to the Dirichlet. Uh, boundary. Yes, so that's an important condition that will come later again. And then, in order to get rid, get rid of those additional uh, quantities, you need estimates on this volume element. But this comes with a little bit of work automatically from comparison geometry for those bounded geometry manifolds. Yeah, you have to do, but that's okay. Up to some small technicalities like this picture. At the end, it's everything that happens. Yeah, you see in this picture. Uh, that it, if you have a Neumann boundary, it could be that with this technique, you do not come everywhere to the manifold. Yes? So from the DSK boundary, I do not reach this upper half. But this is something you can either by approximation or whether when you are here, you start again going here, you can easily solve this. Yes? So that's not really an issue. And this finite distance to the DSK boundary, you still need at the end. With this, now you get that if you have a manifold this boundary of this bounded geometry and this finite width now to the Dirichlet boundary, you get that you have a Poincaré inequality. Uh, in, in the case where the whole boundary is a Dirichlet boundary, that's a result by Sakai. But otherwise, you always have this Poincaré inequality, which then tells you, which everything I told you before, that for this nice non-compact uh, manifold, you automatically have a well postness result for the Laplace. And so let's come back to our original example. Can we now achieve our goal in understanding where this geometry stuff come, comes from? Yes, yeah, so here this was the original polygon, that's the blown up stuff. Um, then here the row is G admissible, so it's really this translation from Kondiatyev spaces to a Sobolev spaces. And the choice of the, the row on the left hand side, so that is really goes like a distance to the corner, near the corner. This really ensures you that on the right hand side, you have this manifold of bounded geometry and that's the distance up to now to the full boundary. But you, you remember that we wanted that the distance to the Dirichlet boundary is finite to have a well postnet condition on the right hand side. Yeah, and, and this corresponds to this no adjacent edges condition. Yeah, so if you so in my picture, it was always yellow was Neumann and blue was usually. But let's assume it's the other way around, yeah? Because then it's not, we have here two adjacent Neumann conditions. Yeah? Let's assume this blue is Neumann. Now, what does it mean to the blow up? If you now go on points, this blow up blue corner here, and you go there to infinity, then you see that now the distance to the now yellow Dirichlet boundary that this is no longer finite yeah, that you can go to infinity yeah, and, and and this is was not allowed on the right hand side so this distance to the Dirichlet boundary finite this is exactly this no adjacent edges condition uh, in the polygonal picture okay so so this uh, we have now understood and now we can of course uh, the well postness result we have on non-compact nice enough manifolds, uh, in some sense, you can blow it down again to something with singularities. And then if you blow it down in another way, then this uh, row that appeared here, you get other types of singularities. 
Yeah, so for example, what you can do, uh, if you go to this uh, left picture here, where near this point, um, you have here left and right a cusp, and the other four points are on polygonal corners again. So what you now want to do here in order to get something nice after blow up is, of course, near the polygonal corners, you still blow up this um, distance to the corner itself. But now near this uh, cusp points, where the cusp flows goes like x squared. Yeah, so that's a circle. So here it goes like x squared. There you now want to have a weight function that go like distance to the cusp points to the square near the cusp point. Because if you then do the same calculation with the blow up we did for the polygonal case, then you end up here with something which is not an honest strip anymore, not a strip with um, like in the polygonal case, but what is asymptotic, uh, still a nice strip. So then this still on the right hand side had nice boundary in the sense that it's a nice geometry in the sense that it's bounded geometry. Um, and if you have the right uh, distribution of Dirichlet and Neumann conditions again with no adjacent atom, you get something of finite width, which means you get a very postness result on the right hand side, which of course tells you then that also you have a very similar looking well postness result here, but the weights of course is now a different on, on the left hand side. Then you can play around and of course do strange things like strange singularities in planar domains where you start with a blown up thing that can also be like oscillating. And then more or less all this condition uh, in order to have a nice manifold more or less tells you uh, that those functions should be bounded smooth functions so that the boundary is nice enough. It should not be too far away to get finite width, but it should have at least some distance to have this nice tubular neighborhood. Domain between these blue curves is again in the picture. Everything is nice. And if you blow, blow this down now, um, no, sorry. Um, if you blow this down now by r squared, you get something like an oscillating singularity. Yeah? So you can play strange games here. But what's maybe more interesting is, uh, of course, you want to do it to higher dimensions. Yes, so basic example, a cube. Yeah, so now uh, singularities are no longer just the corners, but also the edge. Yes, and then the boundary condition would be on the faces. And now, of course, you can go for an iterative process. Yeah, so first we want to, oh, one way is to do this iteratively. So first we want to blow up the corners, then it starts to get hard to draw for me. So I just drawn the, the lower edge here and I've blown up the two corners at the end to infinity. But then of course I still have something, uh, a, a manifold with boundary and additionally I still have the edges. But then I would blow up the edges again to infinity and then I have problems in drawing this. But then this one edge becomes like two things that are like planes uh, like a planar strip, at least asymptotically. And, and then, of course, you still, after this iterative blow up now, you get a nice manifold bound geometry and finite width to the new non compact boundary. So, so that part is nice. So, that means again, in, in principle, a nice Poincare inequality. There is a slight drawback that in higher dimension, you have a new difficulty. The Laplacian no longer behaves so nicely under conformal changes. Um, so in 2D, it was just that you got the old versus new Laplacian, you got some power of rho in front of it. But now uh, it's the conformal Laplacian, which is conformally invariant under those changes which means that if you do this blow up, you get an additional scalar zero order term, a scalar curvature term here. Um, so if you would do, do it so naively, then this would mean that the well postness of the conformal Laplacian on Sobolev scale gives you well postness on the Euclidean one on Konyatia scale. Um, 
And if you do not want to sing more, uh, where this immediately works is if after blow up, you have positive or non-negative scalar curvature. But of course, it's hard to decide whether you have it or not. But what you can always say uh, is that if you start with a stratified domain, such that there is a weight function rho, that after blow up, you have a manifold with boundary uh, that has bounded geometry and finite width to the Dirichlet part again, that your weight function is G admissible. And if you already know, and I will say something on this soon, that your original stratified space satisfies a hardy poincare inequality, which means that you have a constant such that for all H1 functions that are zero on the Dirichlet boundary, you have something similar looking like the alt uh, Poincare inequality, except that here the weight appears now because we're on the non blown up manifold. Yes. In dimension two, that's completely equivalent to the Poincare inequality on the blown up manifold. But in higher dimension, it's, it's different. Um, that's why it makes sense for higher dimension to use this full picture to get the right row. Yeah, so this geometric interpretation, you still do in order to find out what the right weight function is. Yeah, and but this hardy poincare inequality, you still have to worry about. But then a completely similar looking well postness result now for your stratified space. And in the example I gave you for the singular spaces with Euclidean metric and with such a nice blow up as before, we we have such a hardy Poincare inequality. So for example, for the cube, it's okay. Of course, the, so after this geometric part with the blow up and now knowing what right, uh, where to get the weight functions from, um, of course now a part, big part of the job is to, to find a large class of uh, stratified spaces uh, where this is possible, yeah, that you get uh, this hardy Poincare inequality and the blow up to a nice, nice manifold. Like an iterative definition of stratified spaces. Um, and it should be such that the blow up is bounded geometry with finite with to Dirichlet boundary and such that one gets the hardy Poincare inequality. The definition is quite long. That's why I decided uh, to, to tell you what's, what's the main part. So the main part is uh, like have the right model geometry near a, in the neighborhood of a point at the singular set, yes? And so the right model near a point of the singular set is something like that you have like some epsilon that more or less describes you the neighborhood and you have an admissible stratified domain one dimension, at least one dimension lower. So Admissible meant that you got this by such an iterative process starting from, from a point in zero dimension. And then near this point, a singular set, you, you could have, if you come from an edge, you could have still directions in R. Yeah, so that's the R n part four. And then, but perpendicular inwards to the stratified space, uh, it should look something like a cone over the stratified domain B. So it should like, so T um, is like the cone di going inwards, so the, the direction in going inwards, and then you should say how it goes. So for example, so easy, easy case. Um, we want to specify with this um, the, the part of the polygon, so that's, that's the wedge. Yeah, so then B would just be an interval itself. This Rn wouldn't occur, and H would just be the function one, and then this would be T, Ty, and this would give you um, parametrization of the wedge where T is like going inverse in this direction and Y is the interval. Yes, and then of course, if I would have a wedge times Rn, so if I like in the cube, then I would have here time times R. And then since I'm not just interested in polygonal domains, that's 
why there here still appears an H function. So this H is supposed to be a smooth function from zero epsilon to zero infinity, such that all those derivatives are bounded for all k. So this condition assures you that after blow up, uh, your boundary behaves well enough for all this bounded geometry stuff. And of course, now you could take, for example, h equal t, and then this would um, give you t t squared y, which would be like a cusp. Yeah, or you could do do more sophisticated h's here. But this is more or less one way to specify a model here, and then one can prove iteratively that this is good enough. So that's the blow up, which you now get. So where you can read off the weight function for the blow up. Yeah, and the weight function from the blow up uh, for this model manifold is the weight function of B of your stratified space from the iteration process one step below times this T times H. Yeah, so that's the new weight function. And this allows you now iteratively for more complicated stratified domain to write down the right weight function, which you expect to be the right one for the uh, well postness results, because after the blow up, you are on a nice bounded geometry manifold. I mean, it's not so easy to, to write this down, but it's clear that it works. Yeah, it, it's just a bit messy to write it down. So, so that's why this is the right model, and model means that um, asymptotically near your point of singular set, your actual domain should look like this. Yes, and the right, the rest you can can handle with some diff diffeomorphisms that are identity at this point. And then you can glue everything together to get um, the full stratified domain. And ah, oh, I'm very fast. I'm sorry, but yeah, instead of giving you the full definition, that's more or less what I wanted to tell you. So if you have um, a stratified domain coming in this procedure, then you get a well postness result with this weight you get from those th. Over. Sorry for being so fast, but yeah, so that's all I wanted to say for today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, we have time for questions now. And so um, as a question or comments, please uh, either write it in the chat or speak up and ask it. So I have a question myself. I would, I would like to know, I mean, I, I see this as a kind of like a foundation to do work with the, these problems, but have you applied this to some uh, other problems like spectral problems, for instance? We didn't yet, but, but I know people who use this um... Actually, those um, mathematical physicists coming from quantum field theory uh, who, who use um, on, even on, on Lorentzian manifolds this, this boundary in order to get, um, to be able to, to build together their uh, parametrices of, of their, their operators. And mm -hmm. yeah, because they always have to deal with non-compact manifolds, um, this, those results on bounded geometry help in order to to have uniform estimate. But yeah, no, no, here, here, not yet. And of course, maybe, of course, I should should mention. I um, mean, of course, this conformal blow up. There are a lot of people doing doing uh, special uh, stratified spaces, fibered uh, edge singularities, and what whatever. There's there's similar things things are done, and of and they have special very special uh, assumption on how the metric really has to look near the singularities. Uh, which they need because they want to say more. Yeah, there, there's always a trade-off between if you want to have more than just a well-postness result, maybe some asymptotics also on, then you need to put in more on the metric, of course. But if you just, for some reason, need uh, a priori of a postness result, then, then you can can be more more general, and that's what this is about. We have a question in the chat from Corentin Lena who's asking, can you handle non-homogeneous boundary conditions, uh, maybe with some conditions uh, on F and G in such a case? Non-homogeneous, what does it mean? Is this the same as non-isotropic? No, it's something different, huh? 
Um, I mean, I, I, I may let uh, Corentin emphasize this question. Uh, Initial statement was about um, uh, boundary condition, which were uh, with function S and G, but in the singular cases, you presented that with the Dirichlet or Neumann boundary condition. But uh, I was wondering if um, somehow you can generalize that. We haven't done yet. So what what we started is is a bit on 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 Robin's boundary condition, at least the regular ones, um, to say what what's there. Of course, there it depends on on what you want. So the um, as soon as you are blown up, we, we can handle in the Sobolev spaces also a bit more general boundary condition. Also, if you just the scalar Laplacian, but you have some some vector bundles. So so there we can handle. A, a bit more on boundary condition. There's a paper with, with Victor Nisto and, and me a bit on, on this. Um, but I'm not sure whether the ones you want are in there. What's also not in here, but also uh, interesting, of course, is pure Neumann. Yeah, so this here very much depends that you have some Dirichlet boundary where you can actually start. Yeah, pure Neumann is a bit, bit different. Yeah, so there you have, um, can have singular contributions coming from, from those, those corners. But, but if there, uh, this blow up um, uh, can, can help you to, to handle those, uh, those singular distributions also for, for CASP, for example, because on something which is asymptotic, this is a strip, uh, you can use results on, of, of strips again. So that's something probably is also not what you're asking. So I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I just, um, it was just a comparison between your initial statement and the result for singular domain, I was wondering about that. Yeah. I don't have a very specific ID in mind, so thanks. Yeah. What's, what you can handle in this uh, context, but, but we haven't done yet, is uh, anisotropic Sobolev spaces, yeah? So, so what this uh, approach does not um, pay attention to up to now is uh, if you have, for example, in, in the cube, then your direction of the edge, you still have like, at least locally, something like translation possibility. Yeah. Uh, so this direction of the edge should behave differently as if you would go inwards to, to the manifold. And this you can handle with anisotropic Sobolev spaces, but but we, we just haven't done yet. Well, I, I guess that uh, your your answer was, uh, part of your earlier answer was definitely in the direction of the new question from uh, Muhammad Ungum, who's asking, is it the same way as well for uh, Neumann boundary conditions all the way? Uh, I don't know if you have more to say about this than what you've already said, or if that's a... No, no, it's more or less of what I said already. You can do a similar blow up uh, approach, but uh, you, this Foncaré inequality business don't, don't, does not work anymore. So, mm -hmm. you, so there you have to do something, something different. But, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it's, it's at least, I mean, it's ongoing work, so it's not clear what the actual, but the actual outcome at the end is, but it's enough to handle cast. Let's put it that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so a, a question that I, I was running, so the, the cusps that you presented, at least in the examples, um, were all polynomial, um, polynomial cusps. Uh, there, it, 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 is this and and, and and here this this row was this this into the cusp pointed square, which which from the picture I see is, seems seems to be natural because this is a, a quadratic cusp. But uh, do you do you does the middle method handle other uh, um, cusps as well with the appropriate power and non polynomial cusps too? And uh... so yeah, yes, you can as you can come here instead of x squared, you can come with x to the uh, alpha for alpha big or equal than, than one, and you are in business. Uh, non, uh, in general, yes. Um, maybe you can think of, of, of weird stuff. I am not thinking now, but it's not, mm. it's not a priori strict. I mean, for example, this, this wiggling oscillating singularity you can do. Okay. I mean, th 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 this was also my, my, my second question there, because um, it's, it's somewhat known that the, the or at least, I mean, from what I know of the Neumann problem, and, and this might be part of, of, of your answer of, of we don't know how to deal with pure Neumann, that if a cusp is, is straight, then we can deal with things. But a cusp that uh, turns, you don't have nice embedding properties of uh, some of the space, something that would sort of 
tur tur turn into themselves. Uh, uh, so, it, so can you repeat what do you mean if the, if the cusp is what? A, 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 a cusp that that somehow curves at the same time as it uh, as it uh, so 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 it not only uh, goes to 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 zero by getting closer and closer it somehow does this as you tur tur turn on itself I mean I've seen this example in 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 the uh, book of of Masia as something that makes uh, that that breaks the the, the, the point are inequalities, for instance, uh, in general. So I, I was wondering if, if, if basically the shape of the cusp had any bearing in the... I'm not sure whether I have the right pictures in mind what, what, what those bad cusps are. Uh -huh. uh, so for, for, a priori for me is a cusp something which has no, no angle here in two, two dimension, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and in principle, there's this curve here, um, if it behaves, if it does not wiggle too often in the sense that um, a bit similar like these conditions here at the end. If, if, this, if you have a similar condition like this on the curve coming down, that this is bounded mm -hmm. very nice, then you can, can, can do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's an example where this is not true. I, I have to check, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I mean, the, the example that you show here is what I call a straight cusp because it's uh, parameterized as T, TH of TY. Whereas the, the other one, they will not be able to be given as a function uh, in, in, in the same way. Uh, you, you have this loss of, uh, but I, I can send you these examples uh, further yeah, that, on. That would be but nice, thanks. I, I, I have the impression that it might, it, 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 when you want to do the pure Neumann case, it might. Uh, Neumann oh, has to be, be more, more, more careful with singularities. Mm -hmm. That's completely true. So, so about what, especially, so, so here we rely a lot on those Poincaré inequalities, and that's, mm -hmm. I think, not the right start for the Neumann stuff. Uh -huh. But this blow-up stuff, that still helps. Yeah, um, I, I think we have time for more questions, if anybody has any. All right, well, let's uh, thank Nadina again, and uh, we will reconvene We'll reconvene next week uh, with a talk by Melanie Rufflin, uh, same time as usual. See you all next week. Thank you, and sorry for being too fast. Oh, I mean, I mean it's all right. Uh, I, I, I found the construction uh, really, really interesting. And uh, it, it was actually something I was wondering lately, how to blow up uh, these type of singularities in higher dimension in a way that made sense. So Yeah, yeah. It, it, you, you can do this iteratively. It, it gets a bit messy. But uh, theoretically, of course, you can blue in, in one step, but, but it's iteratively you see better what the right weight function is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, I mean, if you want to keep track of uh, quantities uh, very carefully, there's not really any choice, right, uh, mm -hmm. than to do things iteratively. So because there's a theoretical one step blow up that exists that you can, uh, I don't know how to do it with. Uh, Me too, that why those <laughs> definitions are iteratively. Yes, exactly. Thank All you right. very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming.